Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay? Yes? Good. So, yeah, I'm Anthony Rollins. I'm from the Combine Semiconductor Applications Catapult. So, I'm going to take some time today, I guess, to probably explain a little bit about the Catapult as well and what we do at the Catapult and how we try and help the UK industry and try and support next generation products and services for, for you guys, really. So, I'm really here today to try and meet people and try and get more contacts and try and work together. So, we're, we're looking to partner always with people in the UK on collaborative R&D projects, so we have commercial services as well, we can offer lab, lab access and stuff like that too, so I'll give you a, a bit of a flavour on that. And then my main topic is going to be a bit, of, a bit on beam steering, so that's something we're doing as one of our internally funded projects. We have a little beam, beam steering demo board that we're trying to manufacture, and we're going to ex extend upon that in the next few years as well, so that's going to be a continued sort of activity that we're doing. I guess I'm looking for you guys to help support that as well and give me, give me ideas of what we could work on, what bits you're interested in, in in the system, what bits you'd like to see us uh, develop further. So I'll go through the beamformer techniques, analog, digital, and hybrid. So I'll introduce the other pre presenters here to, to that concept um, and, and set, the, set that scene for them. And then look at the millimeter wave and how, how things are going to change for that, what sort of problems moving the millimeter wave causes for phased arrays. Obviously, it's, a, it's an, interesting, an interesting move and quite difficult to do when we, we get the high frequencies. And then look at some of the key enabling technologies, so antenna structures, power amplifier, and integration as well, so focusing on thermal, thermal problems. So some of you already know, but um, Catapults are basically, as uh, Helen said, funded by Innovate UK. So we've had investment of 56 million over five years to set up a new facility, um, looking at advancing adoption of combo semiconductors in the UK. So combo semiconductors has been identified as one of the big growth markets for the UK. Um, and we're trying to stimulate that growth by working with people on the application side and trying to get that adopted more and more into more systems. Um, so we're a physical centre, so our lab's done in South Wales, and we're one of, a, a, one of a larger network of catapults. So there's, I think there's 10 other catapults in the UK, so there's one on, um, there's one on digital, there's, there's health care, um, there's offshore renewable energy, high, high value <coughs> manufacturing, so these things have been established for some time, and we're the latest in that version of the catapult. So I think some have been established for about 10 years, but we've been running for under two years. So we're just really starting to step up our activities and start to do real projects in the, in the new facility. <coughs> so to say it's, a, it's an investment by the government to try and drive growth in a sector. And we don't make any money, so we're not for profit as a company. So we're there to just support UK industry. So we're there to try and uh, to help UK companies grow in terms of jobs and revenue. Um, and we're a national asset, so we're based in South Wales, um, probably because there's a, a cluster of activity going on in South Wales at the moment for combo semiconductors. <coughs> so people like IQE and Newport Wafer Fab and Microsemi on the packaging side, there's quite a small area of, of linked companies called CS Connected, so the, the first sort of combo semiconductor cluster that we've had. And that activity is trying to stimulate growth in the area. So we're housed with those people and we're doing some projects of that and I'll talk a little bit later about that as well. But we're, we have, we're here to serve everyone, basically. So we're here to serve the whole UK. I spend a lot of my life on the road, traveling around, talking to people <laughs> and universities and companies. So if you ever want a meeting, then just, just say. So. so this is the new innovation center we have in Newport. We've been open for about eight weeks. So we're not, it's, it's fairly new. So it's a new fit out building. We're co-housed with a new IQE fab, so a new super fab in South Wales. So we have a part of their building and we have new labs there. So we cover different technical areas. So obviously RF and Micro is my, my area. Um, we also cover power electronics, photonics, and then we have an advanced packaging lab as well, which will underpin those departments. So we can try and do novel integration, novel thermal analysis, and materials analysis as well. So in terms of facilities, we have various software sets. In terms of RF, we have ADS, we have AWR, we have Comsol for thermal analysis and, and RF analysis. We have all the EM software as well. So all these tools are available for people to use. If people want to come in and use those tools, they can come and use them. Or we can do projects and joint projects and joint work together. And we have experts who can use that stuff. We do test and measurement. I say we mentioned the assembly stuff. So we have an advanced packaging lab, which will do wire bonding, die attach, and then look at novel and new packaging techniques for combined semiconductors. Obviously, for combined semis, the power density goes up. So thermal issues become more important. You know, so the die area goes down. So quite often to get the performance out, you have to do something different in terms of the packaging and different in terms of the thermal, thermal contacts. We've also got an environmental test set up as well. So we've got lifetime test for devices, qualification burn-in test for devices, 
and then also saw shock and vibration, humidity, thermal chambers, and that sort of thing. So we have fairly advanced setups for environmental test. <coughs> In terms of the RF kit I have at the moment, I have um, 67 gigahertz PNAX. I've got a semi-automatic MPI probe station with thermal control, minus 60 to 200 degrees. Uh, wideband signal generation and analysis, which is coming very shortly. And we're, we're stepping this up, so I'm looking for people to suggest bits of kit they struggle to access as well. So if SMEs are in the room and they have access problems to particular bits of kit or they'd like to see something different in the RF lab, then come and talk to me, because I have more, more money to spend in the next, uh, next five years. So we spent about 3.4 million to date, and we've got another 10 million pound to spend throughout the life of that five years. <coughs> So the technology team um, says about 400 years, I think it's about 600 now, so these, these figures are probably out of date a little bit. Um, we've got a range of different people there, so we've got some academic people coming out of the university, so we've got people who've been in university for some time as academics can come, come and work with us, a kind of soft start, I guess, into industry. We also have industry experts as well, so we've got people with 30 years, 40 years experience in the RF field who have actually made and, and developed things. It's quite important for us to, to move things forward from a research point of view, so we're not a university, so we take what the university does at sort of TRL two to three, and we try and advance that forward in a TRL scale up to about six or seven, so companies can start picking that up. And really, we're trying to accelerate people's development by doing that, so they can hopefully take the work that we do and reapply it on their product and try and get, get the market faster than the rest of the world. <coughs> a little bit on the application space, so the photonics department are looking at things like LiDAR for transport, um, low-cost pixels, trying to minimize the cost bring down the cost of the, the LiDAR system. They're very expensive at the moment and not really practical for autonomous vehicles, but they need some work to try and drive the cost down. Um, they're also looking at swept beam sources for things like medical applications. And again, a lot of it's to do with cost reduction and size reduction. The high power um, department are looking com almost completely at automotive. So there's quite a lot of investment and funding from the government in electrification of vehicles. So they're looking at silicon carbide and gallium electrode for inverters and converters and that sort of thing. And they have lots of live projects already. They're very lucky. They have a good stream of funding, unlike RF. So we have to work a bit harder to get on funding. But um, again, part of what we're trying to do is trying to conglomerate everyone together and get some requirements so we can get better funding in the future. So things like the ICSF calls and the next wave of funding from the government, if we all work together and have common requirements from that, we could release a lot more funding. So lobbying and working with people like Helen, I guess, to, to do that as well and try and get that, uh, that going. <clears throat> we also have a lot of different uh, skill sets within the catapult outside of us. We have electronics engineers, we have CAD engineers, mechanical designers, embedded software. So we have all that support and infrastructure so we can actually put together products and develop. Well, not products, but demonstrators at least anyway, so we get to, to the demonstrator level. In terms of the RF and micro strategy, we kind of go in two different ways. <clears throat> so there's, there's very little common semi-activity growth or fab in the UK at the moment. We have little pockets and we're trying to support that. We're also trying to help that grow as well. So we're, as I say, embedded in, in South Wales in the cluster. So we just actually won some funding, hopefully starting the project in December, um, Welsh Assembly funded project. So that'll be a three year project, about five million pound value to develop a new um, gallium nitride and silicon carbide process, which will run eventually at a Newport Wafer Fab. So we're gonna take some technology developed by Cardiff University <coughs> and try and scale that up and, and productionize that and then offer a fab offering at the end of three years. So it'll be a, a 0.25 micron process to start and then a 0.15 micron mimic process following on behind that. So if people have interest in that and getting involved in that activity, then obviously come and see me later on. Our part of that really is looking at how we feed test data back into that, into that data analysis. So looking at doing characterization for them and also then the modeling in PDK. So there's a bit of a gap in the UK for modeling, so non-linear modeling of transistors, and then PDK generation to help these people release their process to the, the public so they can use it in the CAD software. And then looking at um, qualification and process proving. So obviously, it's fine to have a process, but it needs to be repeatable and needs to be you know, of a certain standard in terms of lifetime. So we'll be helping on that, on that front as well to try and prove the process as an independent party as well to that. And then the voice of the customer. So we, we know a lot of the people in the UK who would likely to use this, this thing. So a lot of the UK defense primes and a lot of the, the design centers. So we, we have good knowledge of those people. And we're trying to get their, their opinion on the process and drive that back into, into what's been developed so they get what they want at the end of it. So on the other side, then on the application side, it's really about building building blocks. So development boards, evaluation modules, and things like that to try and show capability 
how to best use common surveys in a system. Things like thermal analysis is very important. It's been raised by lots of people. So we're going to run a new program starting very soon, looking at things like diamond heat spreaders, active cooling, passive cooling, different packaging techniques to, to get thermal thermal management to improve. So that, again, if anyone's interested in that stuff, then come and talk to me, and we can partner on that stuff. And that'll be internally funded. Integration, obviously, as we move up in frequency, integration becomes really important too. So again, the packaging, looking at uh, parasitics and things like that is, is really important. <coughs> so we talked about the labs. I talked a little about internal programs. So part of our funding every year is to, is to run internal programs. We run about two in parallel all the time. So we'll be continuing to adopt those programs and adapt them to what people want. So we have an industrial steering committee and people on that committee will, will form views and try and drive that technology to where they want it to go. And the engagement part is, yeah, is, is about university research. So it's about me traveling on universities, finding out what's going on, trying to look at what could be used by industry and pull that through, introduce it to companies, join up in collaborative R&D programs to try and advance this technology. Rather than it disappearing, I think it's unfortunate in the UK, we've got some very, very good academics, very good universities, producing really good stuff. But unfortunately, most of it gets exploited elsewhere. Most of it goes to America or to China or to Asia and gets exploited elsewhere. And we'd like to see more of that in the UK. We'd like to actually bring it back in-house. So I talked about this a little bit already, but um, we're developing modules, obviously, demonstrators in the key target markets. So our key markets at the moment have really been defined as either defense and security and space, and also 5G and communications systems. So that's, that's really our focus areas when we're doing developments like this. That's not to say we won't work anywhere else, but all our demonstrators really targeted at those other markets. That's probably the biggest markets in the UK for us to, to look at. And it's really about reducing time to market for, for those people. Expanding our own knowledge as well, so we can actually transfer that knowledge across to different projects. And then we're applying that knowledge across different markets and, and technologies. <clears throat> the other thing we do with the internal program is set up services. So one, one example is the modeling service we just set up. So we've got a nonlinear modeling service. So we have um, all the characterization, device characterization, and then IC cap to extract nonlinear models. I'm going to move on a bit faster. <laughs> oh, okay. So on, on to the main topic. So this is one of our uh, internal projects too. So beam, beam, beam forming and beam steering seems to be key across different applications, not just 5G and communications, but also defense and, 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 mili and military radar. So talking a little bit about the different techniques, analog beam forming. So that's where you have a multi-element array. Obviously, we're going to change the magnitude and phase of each, each driver stage on each antenna to try and focus the beam of energy towards the user and end user, which will increase the bandwidth and increase the efficiency of the system. So I guess looking at some of the challenges, they're, they're going to be pretty common, I guess, between these different techniques. But insertion loss at millimeter width is really important. Things get very lossy at millimeter width frequencies. Parasitics become very important. So you have to take great care when you design a system. Wideband antennas are not, not simple, non-trivial non to design. So getting, getting high gain and wide band simultaneously is quite difficult. And there's various techniques. I'll talk a little bit about the university research going on at the moment, looking at different techniques uh, for wideband antennas. Power amplifier fire efficiency never goes away. I think it's always a reoccurring theme. I think Avatar's talking about some, some amplifier stuff later on, but it's always one of the critical parts of the system. It's one of the most power hungry parts of the system. And again, at millimeter wave, quite frankly, the efficiencies at the moment are abysmal. It's, it's, <laughs> it's slightly worrying. I mean, on silicon, it can be as low as 10 to 15%. And that's, that's obviously not good for power consumption, but it's also not good for thermal management either. So if you have arrays of potentially thousands of devices sat next to each other, all very inefficient, heating up. That's quite difficult to deal with. And then the phase and amplitude shifting. So phase shifters, again, are very interesting at millimeter wave and quite difficult to achieve. Again, wideband performance is difficult. Getting good quality wideband tuning of phase is difficult. I've talked about thermal management already. And obviously the cost. The cost is high on all these systems at millimeter wave at the moment. I guess we need to drive that down. If we're going to see wide, wide scale adoption of millimeter wave for 5G, then the price will have to come down. It's just too expensive. The alternative is to, to go digital. So we remove the, the, the analog components, phase shift in the magnetic system, we replace that with digital domain. And we can do all that, all that stuff in a digital domain instead. Same concept in terms of focus and energy, but then it has a whole new set of problems. Um, Obviously, the power consumption of the digital part can be quite large if you do it all digital. So you have a big digital chain that can be quite power hungry. It can be quite complex in terms of software and control as well. 
And then I think the other things that are common from the last one, the citizen loss and antennas, and the fire efficiency, they all stay and remain, remain key problems, whatever the architecture. So a lot of people have gone towards a sort of hybrid approach where you have a mix between the analog and digital, try and minimize the amount of digital control there, but try and keep that, keep the benefits of the digital stuff. So you have more control. It cuts, it cuts down some of the challenges. Um, but again, we have those four key ones there. I think that's really what we're gonna focus on as a catapult. <coughs> Looking across the systems, you've got some very common, common threads there. Amplifiers never go away. The amplifier is always gonna be interesting efficiency-wise. Antennas are always going to be interesting, and then the thermal management too. So just a bit of a comparison, I guess. This is pretty common knowledge. So analog, high, high incision loss, or all, all high incision loss at millimetre wave, to be honest. The complexity changes from sort of moderate for analog, through to high for digital, and then optimised for hybrid, so you can try and, try and get the benefits of both. So as I picked up, I think there's, there's these key, key underlying challenges, so wideband high gain antennas, power amplifiers, integration in terms of thermal and power management and packaging, and then also phase shifting. So we've kind of picked up those threads within our project to try and, try and look at what universities are doing in these areas and try and understand that, try and demonstrate different techniques to people so people can pick that stuff up and apply it. And quite often it'll depend on the application, you know, so not, not everything's going to suit every application, and different, different things will have different benefits depending in the system. So some of the novel stuff we picked up in terms of antennas are things like multi-feed structures, so multi-armed antennas, reflector rays, and tunable surfaces, so I'll go in a little bit of detail. This is one example of a multi-feed structure. It's come from Swansea University. Um, it's circularly polarized four-arm curl antenna. So you can basically excite any one of the four, four arms at a time, and then you have a ground or you open circuit the other arms. And by doing that, you can have a beam that tilts between the four quadrants. So it's just a very simple way of actually applying the beam form, the, the phase shift with, within the actual antenna. So rather than having phase shifters, you can actually have each beam, each element within the array <coughs> doing some form of beam steering. These things are quite interesting too. So this is some work from Birmingham University. There's also work going on at Queen's University in Belfast on the reflector rays. So this, rather than having multi-elements and a big array, you actually use a, a meta-surface or, or liquid crystal to actually reflect off a surface. So you can excite the surface and change the properties of the surface, then inject energy onto that surface. And by changing the properties of the meta-surface, you can actually change the beam shape and, and beam form that way. So again, it's a slightly different, different approach. <clears throat> and removes the need for lots and lots of elements. So you can have one high power source of energy and then use a reflector ray to actually do the beam shaping and beam, beam forming. It can be fairly low loss as well, so that's tuned up there, 44 gigahertz, and there's only one dB of loss within that, within that structure. Tunable surfaces, and that's another way of doing something very similar actually. So this is actually again from Building University, and they have actuators, so it's a mechanical system where they move the ground plane underneath the periodic surface this time. And again, to, to get that phase shift. So really just you know, looking at what's, what's, what's new and different out there and trying to apply some of that and fold that into what we're doing with the internal projects at the moment. We're doing some very basic stuff and getting knowledge up and, up and running. But we'd like to hear from companies which, which one of these ideas they'd like to see in a system and apply to what, what they can do. So power amplifiers, this is more in my comfort zone, to be honest, I've worked on PAs for quite a long time, so this is slightly more in my comfort zone. <laughs> so power amplifiers, high efficiency, the various options, I guess, envelope tracking type amplifiers, high efficiency modes of operation, so waveform engineered type <coughs> amplifiers, been lots of work done that in the past. Authority amplifiers have been around for a long time, but still widely used, to be honest, in base stations, probably still the incumbent technology. And then a new technique called load modulated balanced amplifiers. So that's one, another thing we're doing a bit of work on. That's coming from Cardiff University and Steve Cripps. So a new concept of an amplifier I'll show you a bit of detail going forward here. <coughs> so for ET, I think we probably all know what it is. You have an envelope shape there. And what you're trying to do is maximize the efficiency. So you change the drain voltage in line with the envelope shape. So you reduce the voltage when you get reduced, reduced RF power. And that maintains a high efficiency over, over the entire cycle. But it's not simple to do. So it's been around, the technique's been around for a while, it's not widely adopted, I don't think. There's some, some big challenges, I guess, um, particularly for the millimeter wave. 
the power in the digital signal is quite, quite high. So you save on the, the actual amplifier efficiency, but then you're trading that against digital power. So you need to sort of trade off power in the digital side, but also the bandwidth of the modulator. So you need a modulator to actually excite the drain voltage. And getting really wide band modulators is very difficult. <coughs> so there, there is research going on at various universities. I think Cardiff is starting a new project too, looking at wider band modulators for, for 5G type applications. There's been lots of work in high efficiency modes. I guess we've all heard of class F and inverse class F, and more recently the continuous modes of operation um, that came out of Cardiff University. There's lots of work at uh, Sheffield as well. Marlene well, Industries is doing lots of work on this stuff too. So again, lots of benefits to it. You can, you can get very high efficiencies. But looking at millimeter wave, there's a couple of problems. <coughs> Typically, they're narrowband structures, so narrowband high Q networks, particularly for a class F and inverse class F. Although you can get some bandwidth out of the, the continuous modes like class J. Um, but probably more important than millimeter wave, getting harmonics out of the packages is actually pretty difficult. So if you, if you can't get the harmonic out of the package, you can't use that to actually tune the performance of the device inside the package. So, it's pretty hard to get, to get performance. If you look at the waveforms coming out the outside of a package in millimeter wave, they're pretty much sinusoidal. <laughs> so it's pretty hard to work with that sort of thing. <coughs> Doherty, as I say, have been around for a long time. So basic concept is that you have two devices, one main device and an auxiliary device biased in class C usually, which doesn't start conducting until later on in the power, in the power sweep. And when that does start conducting, it changes the impedance of the, of the main amplifier. And then you can deliver high efficiency, you can see the back off the red curve there. <coughs> so in back off, it maintains high efficiency. Millimeter wave challenges again, so combining structures are quite difficult, although over wide band, very lossy at millimeter wave too. Um, so that probably constrain the bandwidth we can achieve with that sort of setup. I guess there is work, again, I've seen published publications coming out looking at millimeter wave, and, and that's an application to Doherty. <clears throat> the load modulated balance amplifier, that's, that's the new work at, uh, at Cardiff University, and we're doing a demonstrator board for this as well. We'll have an evaluation module that we're quite happy for people to have a play with, so we can get that out to companies if they want to have a look at it and see how it works. But effectively, it's a balanced amplifier configuration, so two hybrid couplers. And then we have a control signal coming from the, the green port there. You can form that control signal from the input drive, so you can take a bit of that and, and modify the amplitude and phase. And effectively, what that's doing is active, active load pull. In, in real time on the system. So you can actually, by changing that control signal's magnitude and phase, you change the impedance seen by the two devices. It's also fairly neat because you, you actually maintain that control signal that also comes out the, the load port as well. So you don't lose any power from that, from that system. So you can either use that to tune over bandwidth. So you could change, as you change the frequency, you could change the impedance seen by the device and optimize efficiency or power. Or you can do it in back off as well. So if you back off, you can change the impedance of that control signal and then, and then change that. I'm not going to talk too much about phase shifters, but that's obviously another, another area of interesting, in, interesting work that's going on. So the new, new sort of things, uh, liquid crystal phase shifting. Again, there's a couple of universities in the UK doing that sort of stuff. And there's an example on the, on the right-hand side there of an array, which is basically loaded with liquid crystal underneath. And you use the, the properties of liquid crystal in each cell to change the, 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 the phase of what was coming out of it. And these beam forming that way. Obviously, we have semiconductors. Am I short on time? <laughs> it makes a change for me. I'm usually too fast. So <laughs> we can leave that anyway. So that's just a, a bit of a comparison between different techniques. So obviously, semiconductor mimics very fast. Ferrets are slow, but very high power. And again, it's, it's all down to application, really, in the end, and this stuff. So different techniques will different work with different things. I'm not going to talk too much about this. I think we're going to have to wrap up one time. But this is a little bit on package and interconnects, but I'm, I'm sure the, the, the slides that we shared. <clears throat> but looking at things like system and package, system on chip, bumping and flip chips for interconnects, trying to minimize that inductance and capacitance when, you, when you're packaging these things into arrays, stack dies, antenna on chip. So just lots and lots of integration, effectively. And that's where our packaging department will be working on. So they're going to be working with us trying to develop new packages, new highly integrated, integrated chips. I've got a little bit more. And that's the last little bit. So this is what we've done so far. So we've just done a off the commercial off the shelf sort of demonstrator at the moment. So it's aimed at the X-band 8 gigahertz design. <coughs> just a four patch antenna to do some beam, beam shaping and beam forming, compare our simulation results to our measured results. And the next stage then is to step that up to a demonstrator which will be a millimeter width. 
So we're looking at 27 and a half to 31 gigahertz for the next generation of that. Again, probably a small array to begin with, and then we'll scale that as we go up. And we're trying to fold in some technologies from some SMEs in the UK in terms of semiconductor and combo semiconductor on that, on that next demonstrator. So it'll be a bit more further down the road. And as we follow on, we'll have more and more research pulled into that, into that demonstrator set. So I think that'll, that'll do. Thank you, Kellen. Sorry.